All right. Um, first of all, thank you, Mad. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for, to you, Copenhagen, for allowing a street cook like me to be here. Um, I go by Poppy on the streets, and I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, you guys might know it. Um, let's see here. You guys might know it, right? It's a magical, magical place where I come from. But I also come from this Los Angeles. There are over five million people that are starving or close to hung or hungry and close to starving. And they have the fear of going hungry. In, this, in an area that I represent, South Central Los Angeles, 44% of the children, that's 65,000 children live in poverty. They make less, their families make less than $22,000 a year. And I think that's the equivalent in euros. Another 17%, 25,000 children <coughs> live in extreme poverty, and that's less than $11,000 a year, and the same in euros. In the same area, there are 41% of the 8th graders and 39% of the 11th graders that scored below basic in English and language arts. Uh, out of 56 middle, middle schools and high schools in the area, um, it, it gets worse. 53% 53 of the 8th graders and 81% of the 11th graders score um, below basic in math. And um, at Thomas Jefferson High School, where I work, they fell 38% below in English and 73% were below in math. And it gets even worse. Um, they do studies and there's, I'll just read it to you here. Um, low academic performance between K through 12, high truancy rates, low high school graduation rates, low percentage of teachers with full credentials, just throwing motherfuckers in there, you know what I'm saying? Um, an inactive voting population. Um, risk factors that represent, uh, you know, high poverty, unemployment, single parent family homes, low literacy rates, and, you know, up to 90% of the residents have either witnessed or been directly involved with felony violence, level violence. So, to me, these facts are staggering. You know, and they're even more crippling because these are, these are my friends, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, like, so I'm going to get into it, man. Um, we, have, we have a hunger crisis in Los Angeles, a straight-up hunger crisis, and it's not as straightforward as it may seem. Um, you know, like, with so many paved roads, farms, farmers markets, our weather, you know, we got tree till, you know, we smoke tree till the end of the day, you know, like, we got restaurants. I mean, it seems ludicrous. Like, we should be just happy as clams, right? Um, but many, in many parts of our city, this is how we supply our neighborhoods. Liquor store? Liquor store? Liquor store? Um, there are no chef-driven restaurants. Not one, OK? There are very few supermarkets or little to no organics. Um, the markets that do exist are second-hand second rebate centers that serve expired produce, expired food. We have food banks, um, discarded stuff, stuff you would never buy, you know what I'm saying? Um, the restaurants that do exist are fast food chains. They got the guts to go in, you know? Um, 99 cent Chinese food, um, junk food, alcohol. You know, and like, you know, you bring this up, you hear it so many times, all the rhetoric, you hear all the, all the jokes about, about the ghetto and shit like that, you know, like, you know, so, you know, you start to think like, so what, right? Like, I mean, everyone in life has a choice, you know, um, we all have the ability to make that choice and like, we all have something bad going on in our lives, why do we got to worry about this, you know? What makes this any different than our own problems? 
Um, I mean, like, all these residents can just drive over to the next town, right? You know, just get in their car and drive over and shop at Whole Foods or whatever it is. Um, but to me, it's not that simple because it's psychological. It's, it's an invisible wall. Um, you know, and whether youngsters or adults make their decisions, you know, and lead themselves into vices or addictions or whatever it is out there, that's not what I'm trying to really talk about. What I'm talking about is it's the fundamental belief that we all believe that we have these choices, these equal choices. Um, but it's, it's that belief that we have these equal choices that's, that is, and the accessibility to, to have a great meal that is the fallacy. Um, you can't render the choice the same when the options aren't presented. You know, if you see, if all you see growing up is junk food, fast food, processed food, you know, the meats that they eat there are old dairy cows that they, you know, that all the, the, the processing plants ship out to, uh, so that meat, you can buy meat and hamburgers for 99 cents, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, these things, and no vegetables, no fruits, these things inform your decisions as you're growing up. Um, as a child, they become your nutrition. You know, in our neighborhoods, with the highest crime rate and the highest dropout rate and the least jobs are getting the worst food. And our friend Daniel Patterson, I remember he alluded to this as well in the San Francisco Chronicle. And um, I applaud him when he said that. Um, but to me, this doesn't make sense, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so why do I say all of these things at, at a food conference with the best chefs in the world, you know, with all y'all? Um, because I really believe that chefs can do anything. You know, and that's with capital letters and an exclamation point on the end. Um, because, you know, we're not the richest people on the planet, you know. But when a chef talks, people listen. When a chef does, people follow. You know, I mean, can you imagine, like, a place where a chef, um, he called, like, a pre-shift. And he, he said, everyone get together and we're going to do this. And then, like, everyone was, like, on their phone, like, nah, I'll get to it later, chef. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hell no, right? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> um, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, uh, a chef can command attention in any circumstance. Um, you know, it, it, with these problems that exist, everyone in politics tries to fix everything from a macro level top down. For me, I, I don't have time for that. You know, like, the people in these communities, my brothers and sisters, they're starving out there on the streets. Children, generation after generation, are getting no support at all. Schools are being shut down. You could apply this to any city, any inner city in America. Um, schools are being shut down, programs being cut. We're feeding them chemicals that are corrosive. Um, you know, fuck you, world. You know, like, that's like how I feel about it. So this is where we step in as chefs. You know, what if every, high, just think of this, what if every high caliber chef, all of us in here, told our investors as we were building restaurants that, you know, and we leveraged it, for every restaurant we would build, every fancy restaurant we build, we would, it would be a requirement to build a restaurant in the hood as well. Um, what if we just started serving food in the hood, and, and chefs started getting into street food, and opening carts, and getting food out there, um, and making it a part of the culture? You know, I really believe, essentially, we as chefs are maternal. Um, there has to, and I, I really believe that there, there has to be some value placed back in that. Some value placed back into the spiritual currency of that, and not just financial currency. You know, we feed people. Our nature is to care and take care of people. I mean, getting off the plane here in Copenhagen, it was like walking into an open arms, you know? That's just our nature, to make sure you're all right. Are you okay? Are you fed? Is there anything you need? Um, and you know, it's strange for me because I walk with my feet planted in many different worlds. You know, I'm here with you. I have a very fortunate life. You know, I'm a student of the craft. I study the sciences and search for knowledge, at, you know, the for foraging, the indigenous cuisines, sustainability, heirloom seeds, the research of fermentation, bacterial cultures, microbes, all the stuff we're talking about. You know, I'm a student of it too, man, you know? But, um, you know, but I'm also in the hood, man, you know, where people are starving. So we revel in these beautiful things that make up the super-duper food world now, you know? Like, uh, there's this whole, 
You know, like we're, we're all connected. We have this wonderful view of the food world. But what if there's a whole population of citizens, your friends and neighbors, right under your noses that couldn't even eat a horse carrot or even excess vegetables? You know, it's real. And, I, and that continues to make me think about, like, what language are we speaking as chefs? Um, you know, we have the Internet. Of, co of course, right now, 2013, we're in this real hyper-awareness. You know, I believe the Mayans talked about this, about this, this, this state of being where we were connected so closely and the information was passed so, so instantaneously that they, they predicted that this would happen. And we're at that place right now. You know, um, the food world has never been more active. But really, the question is, has it really changed? Um, aren't we still just feeding kind of the same people? Um, the privileged, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you can afford it, but aren't we just feeding the people that can afford it? Um, you know, the, the audience has gotten younger, it's gotten smarter, but, uh, but still it's this circular kind of motion bubble. You know, we're feeding a small populace and we think we're feeding the world. It's like chasing our own tail, you know, listening to our own rhetoric. The age-old paradigm of haves and have-nots, you know, and I'm sick and tired of it, straight up. And um, so for me, it's about shifting paradigms. Um, you know, we share Instagram and Facebook pictures, and we blabber on Yelp, and we're, we're talking about food all the time, more than ever. But at the same time, we're sharing these pictures and taking these pictures, we're feeding our children crap, you know. Um, our prison systems in America have the worst fucking food you can imagine. And we're supposed to be rehabilitating um, these people, human beings, you know. Um, you know, and we think we're sharing food. We think that food is everywhere. But the cycle continues. Then two generations from now, kids that aren't even born yet, you know, y'all gonna hook up and make some babies, you know what I mean? Like, those babies, you know. Um, not even born yet, are going to have the same divisions if we don't do something about it. You know, so this conference is about guts. And I'm really trying to ask, like, do we have the guts, us collectively, to break this cycle? And I know you're wondering, why am I the one talking about this? Well, five years ago, this happened to me. Five years ago, me and my crew started going out on the streets. We started feeding people. Same place, nighttime, into the next day. You know what I mean? Like just feeding people. I mean, Kogi was getting so, like, it was reaching so many people, like even creatures from out of space were coming down. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like we went out there and we started feeding people. I had no idea it was gonna be a revolution, man. I had no idea. Uh, we were just trying to make some ends, make some money, get paid, have some fun. You know, uh, but the moment I stepped behind that wheel, it was like I knew my whole life was going to change. I felt like I, I had locked into a portal, and I could see things that didn't exist in its present time. Um, I saw these people, these people. It was weird. Like, I, I could see these people on the street, but they weren't there yet. You know, I, uh, they existed in almost like a hologram. And, um, and I, that's why I picked these corners. You know, they were random corners, random streets. Um, but they were like calling to me. I guess kind of like a graph artist can see a wall, you know. Um, then I could hear the hunger. I could feel the hunger. And uh, I won't get too weird. You know, I'm not going to talk about shape, shape shifters and shit like that. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I can tell you that I felt the hunger. And it pressed itself upon us, you know, any time of the day, in the nighttime, in the morning time, in the daytime. And we fed it. You know, street after street, day after day. And then we added technology to food from the beginning. Um, we paired it with Twitter and provided content and c connectivity. We gave a f uh, food a voice, you know what I mean? Like, um, it was the most important thing in this social media space. We were the first company to use Twitter. Um, Newsweek, a as things started to blow up, Newsweek called us the first viral, uh, America's first viral restaurant. 
Um, we went street to street, and through that, I started to develop a style. I started to get information from the people standing in line of how to do it. I had no idea how to do it. My crew had no idea, you know, um, but through that, we, we started to get this information um, and how to break this wall in the cycle. It was take, you know, and what it came out to was it was taking all my training as a chef, and Jonathan Gold, who was just on, to quote him, he said, using the tricks of fine dining to elevate street food the direct opposite of the semi-exoticized cooking he'd been doing at a giant Century City fusion restaurant. Um, so by getting that information, I changed the way I cook. I started to cook like this, and this, and this, and this, and like that. You know, and I, um, I started to realize that we weren't speaking a language that was youthful enough to reach the people um, or for them to even care about food. You know? And so in order to get the food to them so that they would wait in line like that, I had to break rules. I had to go against a lot of things that we believe in as chefs. Um, and that's mixing technique with processed food mixing emulsions with canned meats, mixing junk food with intense purees of organic vegetables, um, and, like, and mixing those things together, making it young, like streetwear, you know. That's taboo for us, you know. We would never open a can of uh, canned green beans, you know, and serve that on a dish in our restaurant. But see, like, for me, the information was I had to do that because it's like when you get out of surgery, right? You can't just go straight into a meal. You have to kind of ease your way back into it, but you had community and people that had this hunger that they couldn't just dip into the food that we were cooking as chefs, so I had to create some sort of a bridge. <clears throat> and then it changed the city, then it changed the county, then it changed the nation, um, and it started to affect other people. Other cities started creating their own street food. People, you know, before this, before Kogi happened, people weren't eating off, uh, taco trucks in masses. It just wasn't happening in America. It was a, a subculture for Latinos and how um, they eat in Mexico and Honduras, Guatemala, you know, El Salvador, you know. Um, it was for construction workers, mechanics. Um, you know, like the rest of society were calling trucks roach coaches. Um, they were saying, oh, that shit is dirty. Um, how could you eat off that? You know, moms were grabbing their little kid, you know, please, that's scary, that's scary. And now those same moms are hiring that truck for their kid's birthday party. You know? <laughs> it's crazy, it's really crazy, you know? Um, you know, so, there's more. It, it mushroomed, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it got crazy, man, it got crazy in LA. It mushroomed, having the time of my life, I was feeding more people than I could possibly ever imagine. It was like hero status, you know what I mean? Like pretty, pretty great. And then this happened to me. Uh, I had an emotional meltdown. Um, I wrote a blog. It was uh, the 20 year anniversary of the LA riots. I just, I just wrote a blog. You know, I was questioning a lot of things, you know. Um, I went AWOL, man. Like, I started calling out everybody on this blog. I, uh, I put up the back signal to even Jamie Oliver. <laughs> it's pretty stupid, man. I was, I was just being stupid. Like, um, you know, but it was just a blog post. I was just writing in the middle of the night and I just put it out there, you know. And then in the blog, I wrote that I might st stop eating meat. I might leave cooking for a while just to get some more pr perspective. It was almost like just convincing myself I was going to turn in my membership, you know what I mean? Like, um, but then it, it went viral. It went viral, you know, like crazy, you know. And um, but it all led me to making choices and to thinking about hunger more, you know. And I knew I had to break a pattern. I felt that if I either left cooking or I stopped a certain way that I ate, that every time if I didn't eat meat, that every time that I made a choice to eat a meal, that at least there would be a split second where I would be thinking about hunger and I could see things in a different way. You know, so you see like after all that happened with Kogi, 
and feeding almost every street on every block in every county, I found myself in South Central Los Angeles with a bunch of kids, and I realized, you know, after all that we, we had done for four years, three, four years, the food wasn't even getting, not even close to them, you know? They couldn't get to it. And, you know, we made food as accessible as we possibly could, and we weren't even close. And that's when I knew I had to break this pattern. And um, so after my meltdown, um, I put the pieces back together and everything, I went full commando mode into this. And um, what it is, is it's, uh, we started at Jefferson High School, and we started um, just doing fruit. Um, fruit cups, uh, fruit in, in the community, uh, having the kids build the cafe. Um, it was a l one of the lowest performing high schools. We, we, bu we built a store, a small little student store. We, we taught them economics 101, marketing. They helped us with the flavor profiles. Um, and then we went out there and we, to the rest of their friends, we made the proposition to their friends to buy these drinks and these fruit cups that were made of coconut milk, agave, fruit, and lime juice for one dollar. Seems like a good deal, right? But the challenge that we had was that everything that was being eaten at that time for school lunches were plastic sealed bagged hamburgers, chocolate milk, and candy. So it's, it's a really tough challenge to go up against that. Um, but then one by one, the kids started responding. You know, uh, we put the flavors in there. We made the cafe from the ground up. They designed it, went out there, and we were big, man, in South Central. And then it turned into this. That's, that's at the school, created a car. And it turned into this. And then we cre created a cafe in the neighborhood. And now it's a living, breathing cafe in South Central, serving fresh fruits and smoothies next to liquor stores and fast food. You know, bear in mind, I mean, I know it, it's not a restaurant with Marcona almonds and sea urchin and the things that we're able to access, but it's a start, you know. For me, it was a start, you know. Um, in America, we lied to our kids that carrots help their eyesight, in, just in order for them to eat it. It's not true. We lie to ourselves that food is accessible to everyone. It's not true, you guys. I'm telling you the truth, you know what I mean? Um, but I have this idea that food desert, we call them food deserts in Los Angeles or throughout the nation, that they don't have to exist, you know what I mean? Um, if I have this five-year plan now. Like, um, street food came along in five years. If we, if we focus our energies in five years, like street food, what wasn't can be, and what was can be gone. And, you know, I imagine at MAD 8, five years from now, collectively, if we're able to pull our strength together and our ideas and our wisdom, that the word food deserts, just like roach coaches, will become a distant memory. Um, you know, I've traveled throughout Asia, a lot, a lot of Asia, and I imagine it's the same here in Europe. Um, no matter the income, how poor, you, how poor the country may be or what your income is, you feed your children delicious, nutritious food that's foraged from the land. In Thailand, they, in school lunches, they serve curries and stews filled with vegetables, fruits, and spices. In the ghettos of America, we feed our children corrosive chemical waste. And I don't know, as chefs, I don't know how you feel about that, but I've made my decision. But I'm just one dude, man. One dude, one city, one street at a time. Um, this is the premier food symposium of the world. I mean, to quote you guys, in, quote, intended to invoke a sense of courage and urgency. It's the number one word, man. Enabling this year's symposium to become a venue where we can reflect on the stories and ideas that no one usually dares or gets an opportunity to tell. So I stand here with the guts to ask you, please, let's do something. Um, Let's do something and feed those that we're not reaching collectively. And you can just imagine where we can go with it. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm just going to, I'm going to play a song, man. Like, if you, if you love the ghettos and you want to do something, y'all can come down and dance. You know, it's up to you, man. <laughs> I, got some mu I got some music right here. Yeah. <laughs>
what's going down, y'all. When worse come the worst, my peoples come first. You know when worse come the worst, the, 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 the worst. When worse come the worst, my peoples that's come bad, first. When worse come the worst, when worse come the worst, my peoples come first. Y'all, some people got good friends, and not I live my life right.